On the 18th of April, 1988, the US and Iran engaged in a fast and furious one-day war in the Persian Gulf. Codenamed Operation Praying Mantis, the engagement actually marked the largest US naval action since World War II. I think the results might shed some light on why Iran now uses proxies like the Houthis to give them plausible deniability for attacks in the region. The actions on that day nearly triggered World War III, but we'll see, thanks to careful planning and well-trained US military personnel, it made the difference in this high-stakes contest of modern naval combat. We'll explore some of the geopolitical factors that led to the battle and its aftermath. Operation Praying Mantis evolved out of an infamous phase of the Iran-Iraq War known as the Tanker War. Both Iran and Iraq had been locked into an ongoing conflict since 19. 1980, and they started targeting each other's oil infrastructure and exports starting in 1984. They did this to try to cripple their opponent's economy, because both nations were heavily dependent on the petroleum industry to fund their war machines, putting both oil production and the means to export it under the crosshairs. Over one third of the world's oil transits the Persian Gulf, so the region back then and today is cluttered with oil rigs, tankers, natural gas shipping along with all sorts of other merchant ships and commercial ventures from all over the world. In that kind of environment, it didn't take long for the tanker war to expand beyond targeting Iranian or Iraqi vessels. In the years leading up to 1988, over 239 oil tankers were attacked and 55 were sunk completely. This had a major impact on commercial shipping, which dropped by 25%. Other merchant vessels were also attacked, either intentionally or accidentally, in the crowded shipping lanes. The Persian Gulf was poised on a razor's edge. Neither Iran nor Iraq wanted to cause enough chaos to provoke the United States or other international involvement while still doing enough damage to crush their opponent's economy. Meanwhile, the United States and other major world powers had their own problem of trying to respond to the attacks on neutral merchant shipping without runaway escalation that would see America or its allies stepping into the middle of the Iraq-Iran war with both feet. That that of course didn't stop the US government from allegedly covertly getting involved. According to this sworn statement from Howard Teacher, the former senior director for political military affairs on the staff of the National Security Council in the Reagan administration, the CIA secretly sent weapons, intelligence, and high-tech components to aid Iraq against Iran. He later retracted his statement, and all of this is of course alleged. But the United States government tried several strategies over the years to restore maritime security in the Gulf short of full-on war. From Navy SEAL raids on Iranian resupply bases disguised as oil platforms to escorting neutral tankers through the Gulf and Strait of Hormuz. The naval escort mission known as Operation Earnest Will was the largest naval convoy operation since World War II and was the first large-scale tactical operation of the newly formed U.S. Special Operations Command, or SOCOM, coordinating multiple special operation assets from different branches as one unified whole. The tanker wars threatened to draw in all kinds of international actors, including both superpowers, which at the time in the 1980s were the United States and the Soviet Union. Both powers expressed concerns about the safety of navigation in the Persian Gulf. Multiple countries sent naval forces forces to the region to protect their interests and ensure the free flow of oil. The Reagan administration had a lot of motivations for stopping the conflict in the Gulf, right? He wanted to secure global energy stability and enforce international law when it comes to free navigation. These are principles that we try to uphold. There were also humanitarian concerns about the attacks on these tankers, but the promise of US military protection still wasn't enough to calm the situation in the Gulf, and things came to a head when the frigate USS Samuel B. Roberts hit a naval mine while on her way to refuel in international waters. The mine was what you would call a contact mine, specifically a moored sea mine. These type of sea mines are anchored to the ocean floor and float just below the surface, waiting to make contact with a passing ship. These type of threats are exactly why I didn't join the Navy. The explosion blew a 15-foot hole in the hull and almost sank the ship. But after a five-hour battle against fires, heavy flooding, and a broken keel, 
the crew managed to save the ship through absolutely heroic damage control efforts, allowing the stricken frigate to be towed back for repairs. Ten sailors were severely injured by the incident, and when the US Navy combat divers recovered an unexploded mine from the area, the serial numbers? They traced back to Iran. The US had had enough, and retaliation was swift. Iran's navy was neither large nor particularly advanced, but their focus was on asymmetric warfare, and it was not to be underestimated, as the mining of the USS Robert showed. The US wanted a quick, targeted, and proportional response to Iran's ongoing harassment in the Gulf, but it would be difficult to keep things small if the United States forces suffered too many casualties or third-party ships got hit. This might sound weird at first, but the US also didn't want to destroy too much of Iran's combat abilities. Going too far would give a clear advantage to Iraq in their ongoing war with Iran, paving the way for a clear Iraqi victory in the war, which would upset the whole balance of power in the Middle East. While Iran was the primary target target of US retaliation, the US feared if Iraq were allowed to grow too powerful, they would start steamrolling other neighbors in the Middle East. Iraq justified this concern just two years later when they invaded Kuwait in 1990, which might have gone much worse if Iraq had full territory and resources of a defeated Iran under their control. The US needed a strong response to Iran's terrorizing the Gulf without getting marred in a wider war. So the Pentagon drew up three key objectives for the upcoming Operation Praying Mantis. US forces would seize and destroy two Iranian oil platforms named Siri and Sasan in the eastern section of the Gulf, near the Strait of Hormuz. Iran was up to their usual tricks of using oil platforms to mask their forces, and US intelligence had identified the Siri and Sasan platforms as major coordination and resupply centers for Iran's tanker attacks and mining efforts. The third objective was to sink an Iranian warship, ideally one of the two Alvin-class frigates in Iran's fleet. These frigates were the largest ships in Iran's navy and had become notorious in the past few years for their attacks against merchant vessels, in some cases even firing after the vessels had surrendered. Public enemy number one in the Gulf was the IRIS Sablan. IRIS is a ship prefix for Iranian Navy like the USS or HMS, so the Sablan was considered the more dangerous of the two frigates, and Admiral William Crow, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, personally called the senior commander of US forces in the Middle East with instructions to prioritize sinking the Sabalan, if at all possible. The Sabalan had earned such a reputation for ruthlessness that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs basically put out a hit on that ship. To carry out the mission, the US Navy grounded its ships into three surface action groups, or SAGs, of three ships each, SAG Bravo, Charlie, and Delta. The carrier USS Enterprise was stationed just outside the Persian Gulf, where it could provide air support from a safe distance. Aircraft carriers are the most powerful vessels on the waves, but are equally tempting targets, especially in the confined waters and crowded shipping lanes of the Persian Gulf. Opposing the task force was Iran's arsenal of anti-ship missiles, which could be launched from land, ships, or aircraft, and had the range to cover the entire area of operations. Small, fast-moving attack boats, nicknamed bog hammers, could get in close to the fleet before getting spotted and unleash rockets or torpedoes, and not to mention the hidden threat of mines, which had already come close to sinking one US warship. Keeping the big carrier safely away while maneuvering frigates and destroyers got in close was the wise choice. As the clock reached 0800 on April 18, 1988, it was go time. SAG Bravo approached the Sasan platform while SAG Charlie moved in towards Siri platform. The plan called for capturing each oil platform intact, followed by a controlled demolition to both secure intelligence and to minimize the chance of an environmental catastrophe, so the captains broadcast warnings in both English and Farsi to evacuate the platforms within five minutes. At first, it looked like the crews were abandoning the platforms as men started boarding tugs and casting off. Maybe the plan would go off without a hitch, and two of the main objectives could be neutralized without firing a single shot. But that hope didn't last long, as the remaining crew began manning emplacements of 23mm anti-aircraft guns and training them 
on the line of US vessels. With warnings ignored and an extended deadline about to expire, the US Navy opened up fire at 0820 in the morning. The destroyers lit up the oil platforms with their five inch guns. The 23 millimeter guns fired back, but at a range of about 5,000 yards, the auto cannon shells just couldn't reach the naval ships. At platform Sasan, the Iranian crew radioed for a ceasefire after only 50 rounds. The captain of SAG Bravo obliged and allowed the crew to evacuate whoever had decided getting hit with airburst high explosive shells from three miles away just wasn't their thing. While Cobra attack helicopters zoomed in to destroy the barracks with tow missiles and 20 millimeter gunfire. Once satisfied, the platform Sasan was ready for phase two, an assault force of US Marine helicopters landed onto the platform to secure intelligence and allow engineers to set the charges that would destroy the platform for good. SAG Bravo's mission went off without a hitch, and two hours later, 1,500 pounds of C4 destroyed what was left of the platform. Over at Platform Siri, SAG Charlie's day started off the same, with some of the Iranian crews leaving immediately, while some stayed to man the 23 millimeter AA guns. But the initial bombardment was less successful at suppressing the platform guns, and enough crew were alive to fire back the Cobra gunships and force them back, forcing an even longer bombardment before it would be safe for the SEAL team insertion. One of the incoming rounds hit a compressed gas tank on the platform, causing a chain reaction of detonations that ignited a raging inferno across the entire oil platform. While the events unfolded at the two oil platforms, US intelligence reported the two Iranian frigates were moored at the Iranian naval base in Baha Dar Abbas, safely tucked between large tankers that could shield the valuable frigates from direct bomb hits. For now, at least, the two big ships didn't want to come out to play, but that didn't mean that Iran's smaller vessels and Air Force weren't on their way to join the party. After the destruction of the platform Sasan, SAG Bravo was heading north to hit a potential third platform when radar picked up a surface vessel approaching at 25 knots. SAG Bravo expected it to be an Iranian warship out for a counterattack, and the group prepared to fire harpoon and standard anti-ship missiles at the contact. But with the Gulf as congested as it was, SAG Bravo held fire and sent out an SH-60 Seahawk helicopter to get a visual identification on the ship before firing. That turned out to be a wise decision, as the Seahawk reported back that the ship was a Soviet destroyer. SAG Bravo contacted the Soviet warship to find out their intentions, only to hear back from the destroyer's captain in a heavily accented English, I only want to take pictures for history. Wow, my accents are terrible. SAG Bravo might just have avoided World War III at that moment. As much as they expected an Iranian counterattack, the fog of war is insidious and it's always a good idea to check your targets before opening fire, especially in a geopolitical situation like that. If the ships of SAG Bravo had opened fire and accidentally destroyed a Soviet warship, there's no way to predict how the USSR would have reacted. But even as SAG Bravo's restraint averted catastrophe, the Iranian counterattack was just starting. By 11 in the morning, Iranian ships were putting out to sea and they were hungry for revenge, attacking any US vessel they could find, military or not. An urgent request for support came over the radio from a US oil rig at the Mubarak oil fields where Iranian bog hammer small boats were harassing the platform and nearby civilian ships. Loitering A6 intruders from the USS Enterprise aircraft carrier vectored in to respond and confirm the Iranian small boats were attacking civilians before requesting permission to engage. The request was routed all the way up to the White House via sat phone, and President Ronald Reagan himself declared the intruders were weapons free. The intruders drove on the bog hammers, dropping Mark 20 Rock Eye cluster bombs over multiple attack runs. The fast moving boats managed to avoid most of the cluster munitions while firing back at the jets with heavy machine guns. But one of the American pilots got lucky, scoring a direct hit and sinking one of the small boats. With the first Iranian naval loss of the day in the bag, the rest of the bog hammers turned tail and fled back to safer waters. Back over with SAG Charlie, still in the area of the destroyer platform Siri, and now en route to intercept another group of Iranian bog hammers, a new radar contact appeared on the horizon. Like SAG Bravo earlier, Charlie deployed a Seahawk chopper to investigate and positively identify the vessel. Unlike SAG Bravo's experience though, Charlie was getting pinged by 
by a Mark 92 fire control radar, a modern system that could guide anti-ship missiles and accurate gunfire onto the US warships within seconds if the incoming vessel switched into lock mode. The Seahawk report came back with a positive identification on the Iranian Kaman class ship, the Joshan. While smaller than the two frigates that were the Americans' primary targets, the Joshan was a French design that had been exported to Iran prior to the Iranian Revolution in 1979. It was fairly modern and equipped with deadly harpoon anti-ship missiles. The Joshan was already in firing range and closing quickly. Under orders to destroy any Iranian warship, but also avoid any unnecessary loss of life, SAG Charlie issued a warning over the radio for the Iranian crew of the Joshan to abandon ship. With no response over the radio, the ships of SAG Charlie readied missiles and locked onto the target, awaiting the moment to fire. This hesitation almost proved disastrous. At 12.13, the enemy Mark 92 fire control radar switched into lock mode, acquiring the USS Wainwright from 13 nautical miles away. And the US Seahawk helicopter watching the Iranian ship reported that the Iranian Iranian Joshan had just fired a harpoon missile. The USS Wainwright and the other ships of SAG Charlie fired back immediately, with a total of five SM-1 missiles. The US ships fired off chaff and activated jammers to try and confuse the incoming missile from Iran, but with only seconds until impact, there wasn't enough time for any evasive maneuvers. The Iranian Harpoon and the American SM-1 missile passed each other in mid-air just before reaching their targets. The incoming Harpoon went for the chaff cloud, with some sailors aboard the USS Wainwright reporting they heard the missile pass within 100 feet of the ship's starboard side. The Iranian Joshan wasn't quite so lucky. Despite dispensing chaff of their own, all five American missiles hit the Iranian ship, pulverizing its bridge and superstructure. The Iranian Joshan lost power and was dead in the water, but the monitoring Seahawk helicopter reported she wasn't sinking. The US ships fired two more missiles as they closed the distance, scoring another hit, but the Joshan still refused to go down. Before SAG Charlie could close to gun range though, a nearby E-2 Hawkeye naval plane alerted the group that three Iranian F-4 Phantom were speeding towards their position. Some sources claim there was only two or one jet, so the fog of war was in effect. The Phantom was likely equipped with anti-ship missiles of their own. SAG Charlie decided not to roll the dice on near misses again and turned to prioritize the incoming aircraft. The USS Wainwright fired two SM-2 missiles at the Iranian jets at a range of about 30 miles, downing one Iranian jet and severely damaging a second. The surviving Iranian jets called off their attacks and limped back to land at Bandar Abbas airfield. The Iranian Jashan finally sank later in the day, along with 11 Iranian casualties. Frigates on the prowl further east, SAG Delta continued to patrol the waters off the Strait of Hormuz in search of Iranian surface ships. At 1300, they picked up the distinctive radar signal of one of the Iranian frigates and relayed the signal's location back to the USS Enterprise aircraft carrier which sent more intruders along with an A7 Crosshair to verify the ship's identity. By now, there are discussions in Washington about if the ship should actually be sunk or not, considering the operation has already met its objectives. Any further actions at this point risked an uncontrolled escalation with Iran or could tip the delicate balance of power in the Middle East. But with the jets already on their way, the Reagan administration decided to at least confirm the identity of the suspected Iranian frigate. Commander Arthur Bud Langston, in his A6 intruder, arrived on station first and could see the frigate making its way out of the Bandar Abbas harbor at maximum speed, churning up tons of white water that he could see from 20,000 feet. There was still too much haze to be sure which frigate it was though, so he descended to get below the cloud layer for a closer look. Screaming across the sea, just 50 feet above the waves, Commander Langston wasn't taking any chances in case the ship decided to open fire during his identification flyby. His caution saved his life, as the frigate immediately opened fire with everything it had the moment he was within range. Flying too fast and too low for the guns to track, Langston and his wingmate flew across the ship and confirmed the ship is the IRS Sahand. The Sahand fires several SA-2 surface-to-air missiles as the intruder flies away, but Langston and his wingman managed to dodge the hastily fired SA-2s. 
Having just been fired upon, the rules of engagement allowed Commander Langston and his flight to fire back at the Sandahar of their own accord. So the intruders circled back to line up an attack run on the speeding Iranian frigate. Langston fires a harpoon missile at the Sandahar from 12 miles away, hitting the frigate dead center and cutting the ship's power. Follow-up attacks with laser-guided bombs continue to pound the Iranian frigate before Langston vectored back towards the Enterprise and radioed the damaged ship's location and status to nearby friendly forces. Under this kind of firepower, the Sahand never stood a chance, and a massive magazine explosion finally destroyed the Iranian ship along with 45 Iranian casualties. Just then, SAG Delta picked up the radar signal of the second frigate coming out of the harbor. The Sabland, the Persian Gulf's most wanted, was on the prowl. A nearby A6 intruder, piloted by Lieutenant Commander James Engler, jumped at the chance to end the ship's reign of terror once and for all. Dodging two SA-2 SAMs and diving through dense anti-aircraft fire, Engler dropped a 500-pound laser-guided bomb directly onto the frigate's engine room, once again crippling the Iranian ship with the first shot. The call came directly from the Secretary of Defense. Operation Praying Mantis is mission complete, and the aircraft are to turn back. The U.S. had delivered its message, and all further attacks were called off. By the end of the day, the U.S. Navy had sunk one Iranian frigate, one fast attack craft, two bog hammers, destroyed two oil platforms, and damaged a further two ships effectively destroying half of Iran's naval forces while suffering no losses. The operation was a complete success, although it ended up being messier and more bloody than was originally intended. As they say, no plan survives contact with the enemy, and the well-trained crews and airmen were able to handle the chaos of such a complex operation. Having aircraft at the ready, not just to deliver the ordnance, but also positively identify contacts, which proved essential throughout the operation. In the immediate aftermath of the operation, the Reagan administration sought to de-escalate with Iran, pulling naval forces back and giving Iran a kind of off-ramp to ease tensions. Iran agreed to cease attacking merchant shipping in the Gulf, and within two days, U.S. merchant ships were transiting the Strait of Hormuz once again. With their navy crippled and military prestige dealt a major blow, Iran signed a peace deal with Iraq four months later, finally bringing the Iran-Iraq war to an end after eight long years of brutal fighting. And ever since that one-day war in 1988, Iran has thought twice about attacking U.S. vessels in the Gulf. And this is probably part of the reason why Iran started using proxy forces instead of directly attacking ships themselves. And if you guys haven't already seen it, go check out the Operations Room and the Fat Electrician. They did amazing videos on Operation Praying Mantis if you want to learn more about this topic. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Please remember to hit the like and subscribe button, and I'll see you again in a few days.